Are insurance companies fair when it comes to matching the products? There may be states that support matching better. Can you name a few insurance denials and gimmicks? What they're basing that on is, is to me, almost gimmicky in nature. Can it be um, classified as a vandalism? If you're going to perform destructive investigation, you should have the authority of the homeowner for that. Best and worst insurance companies to deal with in 2021. So what is difficult? Is it an unapproved claim? The time delay for the homeowner? Hard to say. He sells $2.4 million per year in roofing jobs. He is the founder of one of the fastest growing Facebook groups for roofers. His name is John Sinek and apparently he is bigger and better influencer in the roofing industry than myself. Welcome, John Sinek. Pleasure to be on the show with you, sir. It's so funny, I'll, I'll tell backstory real quick. A couple of weeks ago, we were looking for top influencers in the roofing industry, and we did this poll and say, hey guys, comment below who you watch the most, and um, John Sinek name <clears throat> got dropped by several people, and we're like, can you share some of his content? So his Facebook group has about 5,000 members. He does a lot of videos, but it's closed group, and I wasn't a member. So I did not know, I wanted to know, and apparently people defending him, like, I mean, with the, with the passions, like, Dimitri, who are you? How come you don't know who this guy is? Like, he's really changing the industry, and you're no one, and uh, he is more important than you are, get over yourself, and I get roasted. I'm like, within two hours of that, I reached out to John, we, we've been friends. I have, like, face look familiar, we pr probably have met at conventions and stuff, so I'm like, John, can we just do the interview? He's like, I'm gonna be in Minneapolis in two days. I'm like, deal, done, I wanna meet you. <laughs> Tell me about what you do, man. Uh, so, uh, I got into roofing like everybody, you know, had a dream as a child <laughs> to grow up and be in roofing. <laughs> Not at all, I fell into it and I learned to love it. And two years ago, I found a absolutely fantastic owner to work for at Equity Builders Roofing. And that has really accelerated my sales opportunities and, and just other opportunities in life. I'm in a very good group that's allowed me to have more time to do things. And with that free time, I spend most of that in the Name the Shingle group. And that has been a fantastic group to be a part of. And it's getting ready to open up to a very big reporting process across the country for contractors, adjusters, or anybody to use to get an accurate report on the shingle on their roof. Well, how does someone fell into the roofing industry? <laughs> like, tell me how you get your first job. Man. Uh, What's your background? My background, I have a business management degree that I thought I'd, I'd be in business management making you know, a high salary job somewhere. And I, I lost that high salary job, got back into restaurants and bars, met a roofing company owner and started selling for in him. Yep. <laughs> right, you find, you, find him there, you find him there every now and then, right? <laughs> the best place to find the salespeople is just at the bar. Uh, uh, you know, re restaurants are breeding grounds for good salespeople. And, not so great, but they're there. So, but that was my first opportunity and I took that opportunity and that was in Bloomington, Indiana. I've been there ever since selling and um, it was a fantastic opportunity. And I realized that this is great. This is fun. There's a lot of customer service to it and it happens to be good money. And as I got really hooked to the service process of it and creating the experience and building the narrative for that homeowner, I realized there was other pieces missing and I said, there's gotta be a way to improve this. I don't know what, there's gotta be a way to improve. And uh, after spending seven years almost in the industry, this past year has been a very explosive year as I thought, oh, I'm gonna get into consulting. And then I realized that, yeah, that has some fun and glory to it, but it's travel, it's time, it's effort. And you go consult people, sometimes they love it, sometimes they don't. And uh, me and, TJ Ware got together and created this Facebook group, and now we have an awesome group and an awesome company that's gonna come out of it, so super excited. Absolutely amazing story, guys. I mean, think about what they've done. We have this one search uh, by a roofers, name that shingle. Can anyone name this shingle? Like where roofers would come to Facebook groups and they would just drop the picture of the shingle because they did not know where to find it, and demand was so big, the niche was so unique that two people in the industry is like, hey, let's just do the group. And now they have 5,000 people sharing their experience and they have dedicated group to that. And this is what I absolutely love. You know, on YouTube, we have that. There, there's a lot of fitness gurus, right. fitness coaches. You, you've seen that guy knees over toes? Yeah. yeah. So 
I mean, think about it. Think about what it, he has more followers and subscribers and he's on the main stages and his specialty is <laughs> knee pain. Yeah. And it's it's amazing channel, like reaches truly in the niches. Absolutely love it. Everybody wants to go big. Like I say, stay small, find your niche and dominate it. So tell me a little bit more about um, your group, NTC. What, what else do you do? It cannot be just as simple as name that shingle. What other things and uh, communication talks you have with your community? So halfway into the journey of going from 1,000 members to 5,000 members, I got on and did a live talking about the challenges we're dealing with with product and demand and supply right now. And that just has been difficult from a supply standpoint, getting things in. And how do you handle that? Is it currently temporarily or currently available, temporarily unavailable, permanently gone, discontinued? And then that was question after question after question. and and. I had about 35 people on that live that evening and someone reached out to me after and said, you know, for a group this size to have that many people live, that's pretty good. I would expect 10 to 12, you have about triple. So we started putting content and, and, and actual topics out there to go, to go live with. And it has been everything from identifying shingles to repairability process, what compatibility of products actually means, uh, what documents to use, when and how to present them. And it's just been a very, and, and the community has been so impactful that there's people who want to join and share how they do it too. And what they've added to it or what they've taken from it or what works in their state. It's just those live events turned into, we got to do this more than once a week. Now it's twice a week and we bring in guests for it. And it's just exploded into hungry people wanting content. So let's find the people to come in and, and I'll share my experience and we'll bring some other experts in too. How can you explain ITEL and what ITEL is to our audience who don't know what ITEL is? Uh, ITEL's mission is to have a outward mission on, on website mission is to have a uh, fair science-based, fact-based analysis of products when there's a dispute in a claim to identify what that product is. And that could be anything from a shingle to a tile to wood flooring to interiors, exteriors, siding. They, they really go out and identify a variety of different things. Are they independent? Um, they are. And they... they um, that's their that's their website mission, their goal. Uh, the information that comes back from ITEL seems to be more consistent with trying to find a closest look. And where do you draw the line from a closest look working and the functionality of a closest look and the compatibility of the closest look. And uh, But ITEL really is designed to identify the product. That's the core of their business is you send a sample, they identify it. And then they may be able to make a recommendation on another product or something close or something similar, or if it's still available, where to go buy it? Right at the store, right, right at the road of your hardware store. They'll make that recommendation too. And that's you, kind of a nutshell of ITEL. In your experience, how often do they do perfect match and find a product and how often they're off? Well, there's two components to that. Finding the perfect, identifying the sample properly, th that's fairly accurate. And when a physical sample is sent in versus the app, it's always going to be more accurate to work with a physical sample rather than app and photos. Uh, based on the data that I have, somewhere between 85 to 90 percent, the initial sampling is accurate the, for a physical sample being sent in. The recommendation for what should go with it, the accuracy of that's subjective. My opinion is that if it's not a compatible product and it can't be mixed, for the manufacturer or codes or compatibility issues, that may not be a good recommendation. But if we're strictly looking at gray and gray, okay, you could say that that was an accurate recommendation. I don't believe that it comes down to color. As someone who's a building product placement specialist, it's not about color, it's about compatibility. It's about the availability of that product. It's about the functionality of those two products together on the same plane. I see. Do, do you see the trend that uh, they're getting worse um, as far as like being a good tool for the contractor? That a lot of the recommendation comes like misleading or bad? And yes, I'll just answer it that way. Uh, I'll take take the so heat the, for the, it when I take the heat for it. But yes, sure. I'll answer so it that. So the trend way. is it's not. They're not getting better. The trend is they're getting. The trend is I think it's moving further away from what the mission statement is to be fact based. Um, and and f fair because I don't think all the information that could be there is there, and that the recommendations that are made sometimes can be uh, 
can can move somebody the wrong direction when the print reads in big bold letters with check boxes that make you feel warm and fuzzy and green and colors and check and positive ID and positive match. And uh, then at the bottom, it says in really small print that owners and installers should double check physical and visual compatibility before installing. To me, that's kind of a misbalanced representation of the information. So what's your definition of match, right? Do these match because they're both pants? Do our shirts match because they're both shirts? Because they're in the same family of green? At what point do they match? Do we wear the same waist size? It becomes challenging to say what matching is, but for the average person reading the word match with check marks and all the warm and fuzzies behind it, what's the other information they need in that situation? But without I tell, you would not have a group, you would not be as active as you are. They have their niche, right? Sure. And, and, and we have ours, and it's, it's caused us to create uh, more focused reporting that we believe encompasses the information that even the average homeowner who knows little to nothing about the roofing product could digest and say, oh, this makes sense. There's this report, there's this detail, and here's what it is, why it is, and why you can or cannot work with it, can or cannot buy it, can or cannot find it. Not, not focused on just uh, colors, and it's all very evenly distributed. It's not fine print, warm and fuzzies, then suddenly it changes on a different page. There's, we wanted to make balance as much as possible in that process. So, but without ITEL, you're right. The idea arguably wouldn't exist. So. Just like if uh, insurance companies would pay for claims, so we wouldn't need public adjusters and appraisals. There's always and, an if then, right? <laughs> exactly. If not, but for, <laughs> what are the legal terms to it? Are insurance companies fair when it comes to matching the products? Fair is a subjective term because there's policy limitations that as a contractor, I probably can't even be the expert on that may have matching endorsements or matching exclusions. There may be states that support matching better. So are they fair within the terms of the policy and the terms of each state? I've seen it vary and it, it can vary greatly in some states and it can be pretty close. What's your take on the matching states? Like what's the easiest state to work with Boy, that's debatable. Um, do you want a state like Florida where they have you know 25% rule, but there's a lot more public adjusting? Or do you want a state like Ohio that has some matching laws, but contractors are fielding most of that themselves? Uh, what's your, you know, pick, pick your path. Do you want to go, well, that, what's arguably easier in that situation? But I think matching laws exist for a reason. It, it, just down to the basics that if, if something happened to a home and you had to perform work that was unsightly. And then let's say six months later, you get a job, you're looking to move out of town, you're gonna to sell that house and you've got this big unsightly repair. Does it affect the value of that home? There's some weight to that. And there's probably a lot of other opinions that could dive in on how much weight there is to that. But was it that way before the repair? And did the repair cause that unsightly look to the home and ultimately affect the, the look, appearance and value? I think matching laws exist in those states for a reason and they're very beneficial in favor of the homeowner, very clearly in favor of the homeowner. Um, but they that's serve what matters. Purpose. At the end of the day, that's what matters. Yeah, they're the one purchasing the home. They're the one paying for the upkeep. They're the one paying for the policy. They're the one hiring a roofer. They're the one shelling out the money with the exception of the claim when the money comes back in the claim. And they're really concerned about the, their largest investment. It's fair to say that a home is most people's largest investment. They want it to look right. My next question is about product manufacturers and are they fair? Like I'll give you a few examples. In Florida, after the hurricane, a lot of clay tiles just mysteriously get discontinued. Um, and, and I also see a little trend, not as much in asphalt shingles, like you get a new line and then you have a technical bulletin. Is it fair to the consumer to change lines as often as they do based on the hurricane? So, and how, uh, how many products like that uh, do you see? I've heard about tile products pretty often because it's good for them to keep producing. I mean, we can't make it, we can't make it, you can't repair it. Uh, do you see a lot of it? I think there's an even blend of it. It is uh, anytime a product disappears, especially closely associated to large events and large storms, it's gonna seem suspicious. But we're actually one of the longest running trends of shingles being consistent. For the 90s and through the 2000s. For, for asphalt. Right, right, for asphalt, right? For the 90s and 2000s, we had so many product lines that were bought out, transferred to the giants that are the manufacturers today. 
And we've seen the, the longest run of laminate products, the, the dimensional shingles stick around for a pretty good period of time. We haven't seen a lot of change. Is it because they finally figured it out and product finally is that good? I won't speak to that. <laughs> <laughs> they did fix a few things. They started coming up with certain, certain manufacturers do have what they call uh, regional lotting versus plant lotting. So that way, instead of having to buy from just that plant and the color lots being the same, there could be regional color lotting. So there are efforts to, to make it better. Uh, but I think we're on the cusp of the next big shingle discontinued. The tile gets to be difficult. What made you say that? Mm. <laughs> we won't skirt by that one. I think there's a large movement for the SBS modified mats. And I, I truly believe that that's coming because it ideally will create a longer lasting product. Um, beyond that, there's great benefits for the homeowner on discounts on premiums for to have SBS modified shingles. And so market I, pushes it? Ideally, it lowers claims. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that be a perfect world for everybody? Win -win. Except for maybe the roofer who wants to keep putting on roofs sure. throughout the course of their career. Learn how to repair them, um, maintain. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I have an SBS on my home and it's a 12 or 13% discount on your homeowner's premium. That's great. And I'm at lower risk. So I think it's headed that direction. The research that I've done and the knowledge I have being involved in shingles, I think that there are several manufacturers prepared to roll that out as it changes. So we're, we're, we may be on the cusp of another big change and another run of discontinuous coming around. Well, we, c we can't uh, have enough shingles today as is. Like, forget about discontinue, we already don't have enough. I think that's the only thing stopping it, is that yeah. we can't Demand keep up so with big. current manufacturing demands. So who's gonna roll out a brand new product and say, hey, we can't produce this, but guess what? Announcing. As a matter of fact, they cancel a lot of like, There's a lot, a lot, of, lot of colors. Of colors. There's a lot of colors that have been dropped. There's a lot of lines that have been dropped. There's a lot of letters that have been released that uh, and this suspended is part of, until further notice. Well, and, what's further notice? And th this is also part of the problem too, because now if you know OC drops three colors, what, 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 there's no match. You can't buy it anymore. Right, matching becomes an issue. And then in the in the world of claims, if you as a homeowner had six months to perform your repairs, and you have an unknown timeline when that product is going to be available again, how do you manage that claim? It's all stuff we talk about in that group. It's all stuff that we cover and we bring in experts to help talk about even the policy side of things. But that's all stuff we talk about. Uh, what is the right thing to do? And what does the homeowner want? And how do you navigate that? It's, it's a difficult topic. Easy SSL shingles to work with, uh, supporting documents, just general support, uh, discontinued from before and stuff like that. So you're asking who has the best documentation to support yep. their product changes. And, and I think that that's arguably uh, arguably CertainTeed or GAF. CertainTeed for their consistency. You know, they have, a, they have a sheet that has all their discontinued products on it and every time they announce one, it continues to grow. There may be an additional letter or, or bulletin that supports one particular line, but they've made it easy to put everything on one platform and make it consistent to show that here's all the products that we've discontinued when, and if there's like kind and qualities for it in one letter as well. So that makes it very digestible for a homeowner. They don't have to see four, five, 10 different letters to support something, it's all concise. And if there happens to be an additional one, great. GAF has a lot of letters on the market, and I mean a lot. So they're a little more niched on their discontinued or product changes or outsourcing changes, uh, so it produces a lot more content. So they're, that's- But they're also the largest. Right, they're the largest too. So those are the two manufacturers that we see uh, have the best products, if you were an end user and didn't know anything about shingles and someone had to sit there and explain this to you, their content seems to be the most fluid for a homeowner to understand. Can you name a few insurance denials and gimmicks that like the, the dumbest one that you see and hear most often? So as far as gimmicks, I'll give you a couple examples and you can call them gimmicks, you can call them whatever you want. But when it comes to a manufacturer presenting their recommendations for a repair, and what they're basing that on is, is to me, almost gimmicky in nature. Uh, has that person, firm, individual ever even installed the shingle? They have experience, are they an expert in that? You know, I, I, I pride myself on the fact that I am an expert in that. I do repair videos, I do simulations, I, I go through that. So when I hear that recommendation, to me, it seems gimmicky. What are you basing that off of? And I, I challenge contractors to dig that, dig for that when you are going through the process and they are adamant about their recommended repair or why it can be repaired and you as the 
building products placement specialist. Is insurance co company liable for, uh, not liable, but accountable to show you how to repair it? No, but they also exclude improper repairs. And that's where it gets a little gimmicky. Mm -hmm. If you as a contractor feel like what you're being asked to do is improper or an improper repair, you're potentially putting the homeowner at subject to, to, to have a section or all of their roof that would be excluded from future coverage if there was a future claim and came out and the carrier said, oh, well, this is improper installation and this should have never happened and we don't cover this area. That to me gets a little gimmicky. If you're gonna be the expert in making the recommendation of the repair, better be ready to stand behind it. And in general, they're not gonna stand behind the repair because they're not gonna make a recommendation and they can't even recommend contractors in, in a lot of states. So it's up to contractors, it's up to the specialists, it's up to the experts to make that call. So that one, that one gets gimmicky. Um, do you see, um, can it be um, classified as a vandalism when the insurance adjuster goes in and is like, I'm gonna show you how to repair it. Like I, I have one years ago where they wanted to do repair and they, sh they were showing us and I was filming it and I have it on film, we're gonna play it right now, check this out. Oh, Clay! <laughs> we just have to add that one to the claim. You know the rules, you break when you buy one. <laughs> <laughs> and so his boss is behind him saying, like, like the, the guy pretty much trying to lift it and he can't, and he just rips the shingle. And the, his boss behind is like, well, we're just gonna add it to the claim. And they, <laughs> I'm like, what's happening right now? He, he, he said that it can be done, we can lift it and we can, uh, we can repair it. And it was so dry that it was almost impossible, but he just damaged it on the video. And we're like, that's vandalism right there. You, you wanted me to do it and you cannot do it yourself. And they still wouldn't improve it. Destructive investigation. Destructive investigation, love the term. Okay, destructive investigation. And, and I, gotta give, I gotta give Matt Mulholland credit for that. You know, that's in his course. And uh, destructive investigation. If you're gonna perform destructive investigation, you should have the authority of the homeowner for that. And in some cases, the policy may allow for destructive investigation for an adjuster. So yes, it could be vandalism, it may not. They may already have that right in their investigation process to perform some level of exploratory or destructive investigation if they're gonna cover that. Sure. If you did it and it looked intentional, they could easily point fingers at you and say you intentionally ripped it. Where do you draw the line when you're using workmanship-like tools that would be commonly used on a roof and it tears versus pulling it up, intent, is the real problem with vandalism. And I think almost anybody of legal mind will tell you vandalism really comes down to intent. So was it intentional? That's a fine line. And again, it can fall under that gimmicky thing. I had an adjuster one time with a, a putty knife, remove staples. Mm -hmm. Antiquated way to put a roof on anyway, right? Remove staples and then took the staple, put it back in the same holes and took the back end of the putty knife and tapped it in and told me it was repairable. And that was a suggested repair process for 73 shingles on a roof. Wow. <laughs> How you, it's not repeatable. No. It's... <laughs> and you're not supposed to go back in the same fastener holes. And we ultimately wanted on that when we, when we attempted the repair, we went adjacent to the fastener holes so we wouldn't re-enter them. And we couldn't drive it in with a putty knife and show that the suggested repair was not a reasonable repair uh, that could be repeated. Did you have to hire again. a lawyer to? No. How did you won that fight? Um, very, very good negotiation skills. <laughs> I'm a big believer in this process that if you keep a level head and focus on logic and don't let the negative emotions take over, it can be powerful. Wow, it is powerful. <laughs> Usually problems and controversy, real controversy begins yeah. when we start filming them, start arguing with them, raising voice. Yeah. They will be more annoyed by your logic than, it's a win for them when you get emotional in the negative realm. Really? It's, it's because they've got control of that situation. You've lost it at that point, you know? They now have control of that, that situation and that spiral and, and you're acting on emotions instead of logic and decisions made in anger are often poor decisions. This one is gonna be hard for you, I know, but, <laughs> but I want you to answer. Best and worst insurance companies to deal with in 2021? 
Twenty. So we are gonna we're gonna cap it in twenty twenty one. All right, I can answer that. Sure. And again, this is based purely on personal experience and who I've traveled and consulted and worked with. Wow. Um, so the you're, you're talking about in the claim side of things. Yep. So we're gonna say focus on claims twenty twenty one. Uh, I still think that uh, Chubb was one of the easiest ones to work with. There's not a lot of exposure in our state, that's in Indiana where I'm at, but the contractors that I have helped, that's been a, an easier one to work with. There's some smaller groups out there, the West Bends and West Fields, that have been easy to work with. USAA has been fairly decent, just slow. Um, and then the, the difficult ones, and I hope I'm just not shooting myself in the foot, have been the state ones. So you're state all states ones. and your your state farms. Uh, have been slower. And, and while I've had 100% success with State Farm this year, that has been the longest timeline to work through those claim processes. So what is difficult? Is it an unapproved claim? The time delay for the homeowner? Hard to say. They say reaches are in the niches, and I can see why. 5,000 5, 5, <laughs> members and such a small, small niche named that shingle. Tell me the story behind this group. So we... we me and a couple others um, had this idea to pull all the request of shingle identification off of all the other groups. Because sometimes you post on That's another like group. That's like number one. Right, like, and you could get any response. You could get bashing. They'll say, oh, let's name the shingle Robert or Jose. Or, and they, you get all these comments, and it can get a little convoluted for the person who wants an actual answer. So it kind of started with that goal, like, let's get all those shingle questions in one group. Um, now it has grown into something much, much bigger. It's grown into a new business endeavor. It's grown into something uh, that's going to ultimately impact and change the, the industry as far as how we identify products as a community, as a roofing community. And uh, it's been a fun ride watching that group grow and, and just how organically it's grown. Look at this. Just stopping in to say this group is great, very helpful information, and I appreciate the assistance in claims our company has gone on with the homeowners. So how many requests per day you have for, for pictures, identification? Uh, I, I, my, my Facebook messages alone range from about 20 to 80 new messages This is a full-time job. It, it is. It's, it, it's, it, and you still have a job, right? Yeah, I sell about two to three million in, in roofing. So you sell, and how do you monetize it? Do you monetize it yet, all of those? It's not monetized yet. It will be monetized in the right way. You know, wow. The information that we're sharing on this group and the input about what shingle that is is only step one. Sure. That helps them know what it is, but they probably still have an upward battle to fight with the insurance carrier if they're debating about the product, can it be repaired versus replaced. So we help with some of the content, but we've created a reporting system that will ultimately help as a turnkey product for them to use to support their cause. Do you see the same pictures over and over and over again? I, I, I do, to the <laughs> tone where I could drive around cities and name name shingles just in the room. You and I could go jump in a car and name off a hundred different products on roofs if we wanted to. So yeah. it's been a lot of fun. Do you see a lot of specialties and unique and do, is it, do you see a lot of new stuff every week or is like... I'd say once or twice a week I see what I call um, uh, an antique, a dinosaur, something that just doesn't exist or hasn't existed since the 90s or was a bought out product. And I love seeing those because while we'll see stuff like this where it's just common weatherwood shingles and, and they need to know which manufacturer it is, um, when you get those dinosaur ones, I message them right away, like, hey, well, we love a sample of that product. Can you get that into us? It's this. It was bought out this. It was canceled this year. And it's fun to share that knowledge and everybody learn from that, those, those experiences. So we see a couple random ones, but for the most part, I've got them down and I've, I've got them memorized. 5,000 members. So you went from 1,000 to 5,000 in seven months. Yeah. Yeah. When we came out of uh, April, we were at 1,100 members on here. How there. much work does it take to manage a Facebook group like this? I think it takes the right work. Uh, one thing that we've done in that group is really once, once the engaged members of that group have the information, they love contributing, they love helping mm -hmm. because they got value out of it. It's helped them. It's helped their claim process. It's helped their, their reputation. And they want to share with the new guy. And that's originally what this group was designed to do was to put all that in this group. Um, but you know, it could, it could take me two hours in an evening. Sometimes it'll take me six, seven hours in an evening to go through things. Do you have public adjusters here? There's public adjusters. There are Do Hancock representatives. There's Seek Now representatives in there. There's adjusters in ITEL there. ITEL representatives? I'm sure there's an ITEL representative <laughs> in there somewhere. 
<laughs> They've got to have someone in there. I'm sure someone from DMI is in there as well. So they, they all got to be in there. Do, 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 do you have to kick people out every once in a while? You know, bad we're, behavior. We're really adamant that we want to encourage people to learn how we function and operate as a group and try and keep people in there from a learning curve. But we really don't, we're not going to bash people. We're not going to bash each other or bring each other down. And we have had to make that shift on a couple of people from time to time. But most people are willing to adapt and understand. When you scroll through 100 of these posts and you realize that the community is very helpful, that this mm -hmm. just isn't the place for that kind of behavior. Absolutely. It's been fun. It has been a lot of fun. So uh, there's a story in there, a guy from Georgia who we worked on one for about 45 days, messaging back and forth on a couple of things. And it was probably only three, four hours of total work, but just questions and thoughts and letters. And uh, he just helped a homeowner through a claim situation. Um, and they saw a little single story ranch turned over because of discontinued product, non-repairable, and uh, they were able to move forward with it. Oh gosh, not this one. <laughs> Let's talk about your TikTok career. <laughs> this is parkour. So I may not have a TikTok career, but uh, our, our video guy for Equity Builders is, uh, is great, and we're trying to grow that TikTok brand for Equity Builders. So we spent a little time doing some TikToks, and we have some creative ideas. How many followers on TikTok you have? Not a lot. That is a brand new thing. That video deserves to be viral. I, I think it deserves to be viral. We hope it gets, we just need a couple to go viral, right? How are you not dead yet? Well, you see me out of breath. Oh, no. I'm not dead from slipping. Uh, I've got a great editor who knows how to edit those to where it looks a little bit better than, <laughs> than as challenging it may uh, I mean, look, actually have been. Look at this comments. <laughs> it says, yeah, OSHA, OSHA just <laughs> arrived. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of room there, my friend. I don't even want to tell you out of breath. <laughs> a lot of a lot trust of in those cougar pods. <laughs> I'm just here for the comments. Oh, big old babe, nope for me, football, a good way to die. And here's the thing to be careful. I remember I lost a, a follower, like I did a handstand, still handstand, it's actually was Photoshop because I could not, at that time, I could not uh, stand on my hands for too long, like, you know, a couple uh, seconds. And we, we capture me and another owner in Wisconsin, it was 412 roof, like all the way at the peak, we just went on our hands, and it was a picture, it was not a video. Yeah. And uh, one of the guys from Chicago is like, I'm subscribing, I'm following, you're reckless, like you're the leader, you, you, people look up to you, and what kind of behavior is that? And he was so like serious about it, like I'm blocking you, I don't wanna see it, like ever again, hear from you. And I'm like, dude, I'm a, at my prime, okay? Like uh, I, I actually can walk on my hands better on the roof today than most people with their you know, exactly. feet. And uh, no, he's like, no, this is reckless, this is bad example, and <laughs> I'm like, wait until you see this video. You know, people can associate what they want with it. Uh, we are each our own brand. And, and you know, I think that, that that was meant for humor. And if someone doesn't see the humor in it, then that's, that's understandable. Um, so, what, so what kind of content you produce on a regular basis? I see a um, lot of videos. A lot, of, a lot of our lives are focused about central topics. This probably being one of the most impactful ones we ever this did one? was talking about simulated repairs. Uh, you know, and scrolling through the comments on that. And really everybody understanding, I think a repair is a rough subject in our industry. We mm -hmm. see everything from- What's repairable, what's- What is what is repairable, what's not, what should what should have taken place. It, maybe it is repairable, but it was still repaired wrong. And it, it, it just, it's a tough topic. So we did a, a, a live one night and this is where I'm building out. It's not the best shot, but the content was great. And it got a lot of engagement. And I wanna say there's what, 234 comments just in that live video wow. as people scroll through it. Um, and, and people are using this process to educate yes, homeowners. 365 views and 234 comments. Wow. Yeah. It's a lot. It was a good one. That's, that's probably been one of the better ones. Again, um, not the cleanest shot. Great uh, content. All right, we'll give a minute for everybody to jump in here. I'm also famous for this right here where uh, my face is always horrible. frozen in some awkward position to start the videos uh, just as we get going on them. So, all right, try this again here. This is third time, yeah, 179 comments on that one. Uh, um, building for ITEL, so. So this so, is a great one. This is a really good one, all right? What is a lot, it about? A lot of times you, you, you get into an ITEL situation and you know, a contractor goes and pays a couple hundred bucks for an ITEL, whatever their fee is with shipping and stuff, and then at the end of the claim, who's responsible for that bill? 
you know, if you had a $500 repair in front of you and then the eye tells what triggered that to go sure. to a replacement, well, that's part of the process. And oftentimes we get told that's the cost of doing business. And well, I just fair. don't believe that's the cost of doing cost, business. Cost is cost. So this is a great one because we had a contractor from Ohio jump in on the live and explain how she does it within her organization and bills the TARP service, the ITEL service, everything in the end. It was a very educational and informative uh, video that clearly the community enjoyed because it did dive into how to go through that process and make sure that you're not just suffering those costs of doing business throughout the process. When they deny a claim based on not matching, how much is it uh, on adjuster and how much is it on insurance? Like who makes that decision? Because uh, I remember my days, you know, you get an ITEL, you usually show it to your adjuster, right? Like report or whatever. Is it adjuster or is it insurance, desk adjuster, insurance policy? Uh, I often talk about the decision maker in, in the policy and, and who that is. You have to define that early in the process and learn who that is as a contractor. Uh, if it is a staff adjuster who can make the decisions that you're working with directly, great. That's who you're having that conversation with. If it's a the person who is on the roof How do you identify? Do you ask a question in the beginning? Yeah, I typically like to, you know, find Are you out the their decision role maker or someone else. If, if I can't define it, I will ask that direct question. But there's companies that are set, Hancock, Seek now, you know, they're set to come out and take photos. And most people in the industry know that they're not the decision maker. So we're not going to have those kind of discussions. We ultimately are going to get to a desk person or another staff adjuster that will make that decision. If it's unclear in that moment, let's take the situation of an independent adjuster. An independent adjuster, I often have to ask, are you writing the claim or making a recommendation? Because if they're just making a recommendation, they may not be the decision maker on repair versus replace. If they're writing the claim cradle to grave, then they're probably the decision maker on it. And that's who I have to have that conversation with. Um, but you, you've, you've said it a couple times and I'm not picking on you, but the word match is, is a word I, am only so fond of because it's not about match. So when I'm having a conversation with an adjuster, the decision maker about match, it's not match, it's compatibility to the product, it's availability of the product, and it's the ultimately the repairability of that product uh, and the decisions that really come into play. We can all go buy five different brands gray shingles and stick them up there and from a distance you may be able to tell the difference, you may not. Keen eye, I'll spot it all day long. If it's got algae, I'll spot it all day long. Match is a tough word. It encompasses so much more than just match when it comes to repairs. What's your take on appraisal process? I think that it has a useful space in our, in a, it's there for a reason, okay? And you, you have $2.4 million this year under your belt. How many appraisals do you have? Zero. Zero? Zero. Why, why, you don't need it? Like who needs appraisal? And I when think, do you need appraisal? I think that, that it depends on your state leverage. How, how, how much leverage do you have based on your state guidelines, the policies, and the carriers that you're working with? Can you explain the appraisal process to those yep. who have never done it? Yes, absolutely. Because I think that, and I'll probably get a little shade thrown at me for this, but it is what it is. The appraisal process, as I understand it, and I'm not a public adjuster, is, is there to help determine the value of the claim. Let's shorten it down to that. So if, if we feel the claim is, if I felt the claim was 15,000, you felt it was 10,000, uh, but we both see closely eye to eye on scope. We both think it's a full roof. Uh, appraisal is in general intended for that. Oftentimes it's used for both scope and value because scope affects value and there are states that that applies in where scope ultimately affects value. So you can appraise scope and then we see that taking place. This year, we've seen a lot more contractors get appraisal or homeowners, they're the ones that are ultimately requesting it, get appraisal requests denied because it's a scope issue, not a value issue. But in general, the appraisal is, is designed for two parties to be hired, unbiased, two independents that go out and decide the value of that claim. And again, in some states, it may be scope because that affects value, but that is definitely more of an adjuster question. That's just kind of a very but appraisal usually um and correct me if i'm wrong we've done few appraisals and i've seen few appraisals usually it's not when uh like your example was 10 and fifteen thousand full roof usually <laughs> way off, yes. usually it's repair 
to, uh, in full replacement. So it goes from $2,000 to $60,000. That's Correct. where you need it. So who usually pra uh, is for appraisal? Is it in favor of insurance company or, the co or a contractor? To, to the appraisal is in favor of the, the, the homeowner. It's in favor of the contractor for the most part. Um, and in, the, in those situations, because I have, I have one in my history where the claim was 23,000 and it went to 68,000. And that was scope and value overall because scope affected value. Their appraisal allowed for all of that to be reviewed. Um, and we had a really good person working on that and they moved it, it was a tornado claim and they moved it to that mark and allowed for all the proper construction to take place. Uh, so that one was very much in favor of the homeowner and ultimately in the contractor because it was a much bigger job for the contractor. But a, a lot of times we see appraisal have kind of I'll say a, a broad scope of what they look at uh, overall, but, but some carriers are getting smart and sticking to their guns with what their appraisal clause allows. And if it really is designed to be an assessment of value, it may not be a space to talk about repair or replace and they may get appraisal denied. We've seen that take place in a couple of situations. And I don't mean that bad against any public adjuster. I just, I've seen it across the board be perfectly fine to talk every scope item this year and certain carriers are saying, no, this is a scope issue and we won't go to appraisal on it. When is the time to sue insurance company? It's very hard. Every once in a while you have to do it. When do you make the decision? So in, in my history of handling claims, we've never had to take it that level. So I may not be the best person to answer that question, but what it really comes down for, for me from the outside looking in is, is that the only option? Is that is is the homeowner there? Is the building owner, the policy holder there? That the only way they'll be made hold is is that process. Or are there additional damages that have resulted of that claim not being approved or paid out? Uh, and and there's damage that have to be addressed with at that particular time frame. So that that's where I see from outside looking in to be most relevant for for legal action to take place is one of those two factors, but I've not had to experience it. So it's, it's hard for me to speak on that one. When someone should hire a public adjuster? <clears throat> that can vary again, state to state based on leverage. And there's a lot of contractors who involve a public adjuster from the word go. There are certain states like Florida where you're gonna see a lot more public adjusters because of Why is that? the laws and guidelines they have about what contractors can and can't do, um, can and can't say. Uh, as far as negotiating and talking about the claim. So it may be more necessary in one state. It may be the business model of that particular contractor in another state to always bring in a public adjuster. If you were a sole owner and you wanted to focus on your, your sales and your operation side, you may try and turn every claim over to a public adjuster, let them negotiate it when it comes back to you. So there's such a broad vision of when that comes into play. The sooner the better if it's not going well, because a contractor can muddy it up a homeowner can muddy it up because a homeowner is almost the quickest to get emotional in the process. <laughs> and it can get a little, bit, a little bit dirty and difficult to go back and have a public adjuster try and step back in and say, oh, I gotta clean this up a little bit first before I even have a chance to do anything. So if there's a whiff of it, the sooner the better. Uh, people often think in the group that I'm against appraisal and that I'm against the public adjusters. I'm not. TJ, great public adjuster, right? I, I, Matt, Matt, who speaks in our group a lot, uh, great public adjuster. Um, but for me personally, I've found a way to leverage the position on behalf of the homeowner with what's right, what, what is the right thing, the honest and the ethical thing, and not need to go that route. But for one business model, they may need it right away. When you do need it, the sooner you get them involved from a knowledge standpoint to make sure your file's clean and ready to hand over them, the better. How much potential smart people have in this industry? If someone would enter a roofing industry, like, to become someone like you, to learn the game, to, I mean, you're educated, man. You gave up corporate career and roofing in 21, roofing industry in 21. I mean, we have public adjusters, we have um, regular adjusters, I guess. We have all, all these players. We have obviously salespeople, business owners, like how much potential is in the roofing business? And uh, what do you think like is trending as far as like jobs? Like who do we need more of? In the roofing community as a whole? Yes. Wow, that's a great question. I would say that knowledgeable salespersons is, is, is where I would start. There's a lot of great salespeople. And I think that with knowledge, you have a better ability to service the, the customers. And then ultimately that affects our industry from a roofing community. 
And oftentimes we get into this because like I fell into it, I saw sales, I saw commission and we move into it. And at any particular time, we're trying to shift from low skill to high skill. You can have all the will in the world, all the drive to go out and do things. You will only get better at that trade if you increase your skill, your knowledge. And I didn't, I didn't have a degree in roofing or any knowledge. I have, I have a degree in business management. But do you learn and, how to learn? Technically, I have a degree where I should be owning a business. And, and I figured out how to learn and what information I needed to. In 2016, the first time I handled a large $70,000 discontinued project that we overturned on a discontinued product, I was like, this is the thing. So I went and sought the skill. And I think that as people enter the roofing industry, owners or salespersons, salespersons in particular, because they'll ultimately serve as their customers better, the quicker they seek skill, the better. And it's not saying that there aren't skilled ones out there. The sooner you increase your skill curve on that X, Y axis, you will greatly improve your ability to succeed and service the customer. Because it's really about the homeowner. Sell with an act of service. So you can service them best with your knowledge. Love it. So how fast can someone like you educated, maybe bartending right now, can enter the sales position and make first hundred thousand dollars a year? One, two, three years? Can I brag about somebody sure. I work with as a peer? Let's do it. So uh, at, at Equity Builders, uh, the, the same month I joined Equity Builders, uh, we had this sharp kid. I call him a kid. He's only a couple years younger than me. So everybody younger than you is a kid, right? So the sharp kid, Alex, who came from the auto sales industry. So he was in sales, but a very different industry where the consumer comes to you. The consumer calls you. You don't, you don't go door knock. You want to buy a car? Want to buy a car? So he came from auto. So he had to flip his mindset. But the first six months, we were on the phone almost every day. And he was sharing skill, sales tactics with me and I was sharing knowledge with him. And we fed off of that back and forth, back and forth. And this is during COVID. This is when, when everything's shut down. How are we selling? What are we doing? What are we changing? How do we react to this? So he's soaking in my years of, of skill and knowledge and the shingle and, and discontinued products and what exists out there, compatibility available. And I'm soaking in sales tactics that he's used for years. And I was already selling. I'm, I was a pretty solid salesperson at that point. Um, but he, in his first year, he, in, from May to the end of the year, he sold a million in a predominantly asphalt market in a small town in Indiana, a million. So for those guys wanting to go make a hundred grand, yeah, you could do it in an easy six, seven, eight months, grow your skill set, right? Whether you need to learn more about sales, learn more about the product or growth, grow your skill set because he was already sharp at sales, but he quickly, so you could do it in less than a year. Just got to be hungry for it. Right, I've seen it so many times. I just <laughs> wanted my audience to hear it from someone else. Right. Like if you're smart, if you learn how to learn, it's it's not that hard. It's not that hard. And again, he's just, he's accelerated. And then this year, Alex is on pace to hit 2 million. So here he is in his second year. So that's proven pattern. So that means in a six, seven month time frame, he closed a million. And then he's in his second year, and he's going to close two. That means he's closing about a million every six months consistently in his first 18 months in roofing. But he was dedicated to the cause, dedicated service, and grew his knowledge as fast as he could. I love it. I love working with that guy. Can you name uh, someone we don't need or have too many of, like third-party players? Is it you know, like do we have a service or someone that already oversaturated? Maybe in some markets they are. Like ITEL, for example. <laughs> We don't have enough ITIL. <laughs> we don't have enough that's time. why we have a business that's about ready to blow up. Uh, uh, but uh, I mean, uh, I, I see a huge um, increase of public adjusters. I see a huge increase of, you know, like everybody wants to be umpire. Like, who? so I, I think that you can call it oversaturation. But when COVID hit, we had. Uh, we had a lot more subbing out of the inspection process. So it really grew the Hancock, the Seek now, mm -hmm. and it sped up learning curves that I think may have- Third party for yeah, insurance companies. Third, third parties, right? And I think it, it tried to fast track learning curves that you can't fast track. I mean, skill, I just said it, skill is so important. It's, on, it's important on both sides, whether you're on the carrier side or on the, the contractor side, skill at your trade, being an expert at what you do is so important. So when so much got, subbed out to third parties to keep adjusters out of the field because of what was going on. We got saturated and flooded and carriers that never used third parties were starting to use third parties. And it was a big learning curve 
for contractors to react and how to handle that. And it created frustrations. It created some confusion, some poor communication. Uh, and it, it, puts a, it put a bad taste in some homeowner's mouth for the, their experience with their claim process. And now we've got a lot of those in the market. And there's good guys in there. Don't get me wrong. Like there are absolutely very talented people at that. Uh, I have people I've worked with who've shifted to that side that, okay, they're on great with it. But when we got hit with that, I feel like the skill set didn't support the saturation that hit at the same time. And that made it difficult. The flip side, the thing we lack the most is really good reporting on products. There's one giant monopoly dinosaur doing it all. And we've trusted them blindly for years. And I think that now has- Monopoly is yeah, never good. Yeah, no, because it, 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 it really leaves the power in just that one entity's hands, whatever direction Tell it Tell me shift. what you're up to. I know you, you're on the moves. I've seen you post that you're about to announce something. And if you're ready, like this could be your opportunity. Like, so NTS ID is going to have a full reporting system where you'll be able to go online. You'll be able to fill out the form. Like a website? Purchase, yep. The website's actually live. We just haven't made the announcement yet. So anybody who watches we, this video. We're going to put it in description yeah, below. Yeah, there you go. It, it's, it'll be there ready for you to go. And you go on, you order your report, you send your sample into our shingle lab in Texas and our technicians analyze it, evaluate all the specifications, fill out a report with all the supporting documents from the manufacturers. Can people ship you the product? They have to. They have to. We are gonna be very adamant not to do it electronically for this first phase because we believe based on our numbers and statistics of what we've tested otherwise, that the most accurate reporting comes from direct physical samples. So we want direct physical samples for two reasons a library and archive, uh, a history uh, of all those products, but we also want it to maintain uh, the most pure sampling and reporting that we can. So it's gonna be called NTSID. And uh, it was funny because when we got into it, we said, oh, name that shingle. And then we realized that this is probably gonna turn into name that surface as we add other services to the beyond just shingles. So we shortened it down to NTS identification and then it landed on NTSID. So we are full reporting right now, and it has been a very, How much does very, it cost? Uh, the intro price right now is 110, and we believe that it's a much more superior product than the other options on the market, and, and we want the price to reflect that as this grows. So the, the introductory phase, we're through the beta, but the introductory phase where it's gonna be live to everybody will be that price for a limited time frame because we want people to experience it, and we truly believe that once they get on board with it, once they utilize it, that they're going to enjoy the experience. And you, know, you know how insurance companies are, they like to discredit you and discredit your report, especially if you're a player, like that's why, you know, they accept Xactimate and they don't accept like QuickBooks right. or like Excel spreadsheet right. estimate. What will make insurance companies to accept your reporting if it's different from your competition? You just asked me my favorite, least favorite question. And you probably know that from reading through the group, if you looked at the group at all, but uh, who, are they or anybody else to tell you what is accepted versus not accepted? Mm -hmm. If you can find that in a policy that we only hire ITEL, well then the insurance camp companies have monopolized the program already, exactly. right? If that doesn't exist in the policy, what's one third party testing to the next third party testing? If it's third party and truly unbiased, what's the difference? Who, who says that they can't accept it? Flip, flip the role, flip the mindset. We get asked that question so much, the me. entire time. Every time we talk in the group, every time someone new comes to that group and they learn that we're gonna do, do reporting, well, well, how will the insurance companies accept it? They accept my repairability abilities all the time because I'm the expert at that. Be the expert at what you do and stand behind it. Like have some grit in what you do because we really are the experts in that knowledge and that experience. So when you pay money for an unbiased third party report, that's fully backed by other details. Ask them why they don't accept it. Put the question back on them. I, I have the same fight, and my fight was actually coming from many, uh, like when we start uh, rating manufacturer sh shingles, right? So we would do like 10, and we would get a room of like 10, 15 uh, guys, 
and uh, I have to talk to lawyers. It's like, oh, why weight matters? Oh, what granular laws have to do with anything? Or why are you ranking packaging and stuff? And I'm like, well, because it's important to us. I'm a consumer. Right. I can go uh, buy Mercedes-Benz and BMW, rank them, or two phones, and I can say, well, I think this is better for my user experience. Yeah. I can look at a package and say, that package is garbage, that package is good. I want more of this. But yet, Manufacturer, like literally, I've been sued over it, and lawyers like, who are you? Well, I'm a business owner. I'm, I'm, I'm buying your product, and I get to share my experience and get to rank your product. Yeah. Who are you to tell me that I cannot do that? I absolutely love this. It's you're right. Flip it on them. Flip who, it is. Who, who are they to say that? The the coolest thing is this. Like <laughs> I, I remember, like uh, we have the biggest fight over weight. Like this weight of the shingle yeah. matters. And you know, like you might say it doesn't matter. I say, but when, uh, there's a few players that used to put weight on, on their the bundles. Mm -hmm. And used to advertise how heavy they are and how good. Later, you know, give it a decade, they remove the weight, right? And now they remove the like the whole thing because it's lighter. And now they're saying why weight matters. Are you engineered? They're asking me that. Like I'm talking about like a real conversation with a lawyer. <laughs> Asking me, are you engineer? Why are you talking about this? I'm like, all right. Why did your brand advertise it 10 years ago? Yeah. You know, and they're like, oh, you're a marketing company. No, you are a marketing company. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually reporting. Between two of us, I'm less marketing company than you are. Yeah. Anyway, I love it. And this is a great point. Like, we cannot have only one. We should have options. Yes. And I feel like if, like... Roofers will support you. I know, like I know you, you will grow super fast. And when the roofer supports you, other parties will have to accept you. Yeah, but it's, it goes beyond that too. Think, think of everybody in this position. You know, we, we saturated the market with, with inspectors that weren't decision makers at one point. At what, at what point do the, the, do the IAs and, and they ultimately become responsible for purchasing products? Are they going to want information about whether they can or cannot repair before they make a recommendation? It's not just for roofers. The long-term vision of this product and this reporting is to have a very accurate report. Some people may not like it, but if it's going to make anybody's life easier, it's ultimately the homeowner. So the people that are employed with making the homeowner's life easier, the policyholder's life easier, they should get on board with it. Independent, carrier side, contractor side, doesn't matter. If we just want to just take a, a turnkey, one call close and decide if we can or cannot repair this system by identifying it accurately and what are all the attributes that affect this product and the letters that support it, let's go get that report and be done with this instead of opening it 10 times. There's gonna be people that don't wanna open a claim five and 10 times and they may want some different reporting. We'll see. Absolutely love it. Well, you have such a clean record, like 2.4, just your sales, just your numbers, 2.4 million, never sued insurance company never have appraisal uh, not this year i've had it i've had appraisals in the past not, not, not this, this year. not this year uh but you know how many people out there who just you know like every other claim goes here and there. i want you to give advice to someone in sales someone who do what you do how to be successful how to be more like you and less like those guys who just i feel like abusing the system arguing and fighting because you are a great leader and great example of someone who is seem to be very reasonable how do you position yourself and how do you keep you cool i guess i tell myself before i get out of that truck that i'm not going to be emotional and i think for the salespersons that do meet with meet with adjusters then you remember that this is just another person stop looking at them as a barrier or the bad guy uh, they may be ultimately but we don't know that going into it you know, your emotions stay in the truck. You go into it like another sale process. The more skilled you are, the more confident you'll be in that process. So increase your skill is my biggest advice, but leave the emotions in the truck and go out there. And when the emotions hit you, find a way to buffer that emotion. Um, you know, it's a great quote from a movie that says, it's okay to lose to opponent, not okay to lose to fear. And if you don't know the movie, that's okay. You're right in the right age group, but it's from Karate Kid, right? <laughs> he's on the ground and he's telling him it's okay to lose to, to the opponent. It's not okay to lose to fear. Fear is not what's going to stop you. That's not going to be the emotion that shuts you down. So don't be afraid, but don't go into guns a-blazing. I would rather use my logic and, and go into that situation and 
discuss that with them on a neutral playing field. Let's, let's treat you with the absolute respect and see what I get back for treating you with respect. If, it's, if I get garbage back, I'm still not gonna shift down to garbage because when you play in the mud, you get dirty. That's not fun, nobody wants to be there. So I stay at my level regardless of what level that particular individual. So leave the wrong emotions in the truck, get skilled at what you do and become an expert. Soak up all the knowledge you can and stay at your level. Determine your level and stay at your level. Don't let the other person go to a different level. When we sell to a consumer, and we go in, we want to try and meet them on a certain level and sell there. You're doing the same thing in the adjustment process. Meet them on a level. If they want to low blow and chop and cut, I'm not going to go down there. And I highly discourage anybody doing that. And if you truly have a dedication to the homeowner, to the cause, and to the selling with an act of service, you're going to find a, ded a true dedication that makes you committed to find the next way to overturn that. And you will know when to turn them over to the next person, turn them over to a public adjuster. This one's bigger than what I know at this point, and I have to turn this over. But those are my quick recommendations. Uh, give one advice to the homeowner. One advice to the homeowner. So if you are a homeowner, uh, like on the claim side? Yeah, yeah. Like started the claim, about a call insurance company, maybe already in the middle of some kind of dispute. You have a contract or you have maybe matching problem, just in the process. If a homeowner is getting ready to start a claim, I think one of the valuable questions that they could ask that's missing from the narrative for most uh, experiences I've seen. Uh, what happens if it goes wrong? A homeowner should ask, well, what if they deny it? What if they only write some of it? Well, you know, what, what, are the, what are the bad outcomes here? Tell me the bad outcomes. Because in most cases, and I'm guilty of this, we go in and we pitch the success, the claim, and this is battered, Over this promise. is damaged, this is, you know, this is gonna be an easy, guaranteed. this is right, <laughs> this is guaranteed. And I think that, that the homeowner needs to be asking for the full narrative from a contract or whoever is presenting that to them. Okay, that's great. You know, I have noticed some of the neighbors going through this process. What if it goes wrong? What if they deny the claim? What if they only write for repairs? You know, what, what, what do we do from there? What's your process after that? What's the next step? And if they ask those questions, I think it's another vetting level that they have in that particular situation to really understand, is, am I in front of an expert? Is this person really prepared to speak eloquently or do they at least have a process? Maybe the process is we've got an expert. We've got a public adjuster who will come in and negotiate to help keep things moving on your behalf. Do they have a process? Do they have the knowledge? And you only learn that when you ask, what do we do if it goes wrong? I've heard the phrase before. You can tell a good contractor who's a good contractor versus a bad contractor when something goes wrong and how they handle it. Homeowners should just go ahead and vet that question right now. Okay, what if this goes sideways? You know, what's your next step? What's the next process? It's a good question to ask because it's not often part of the narrative. Love it. Can I get you a commitment to answer questions under this video later? Can you come yeah. back later? Yeah. Guys, comment away your questions for John. He's absolutely amazing. Give it a like if you haven't done so yet. Subscribe to the channel and comment any questions and both me and John will be monitoring the questions. See you guys in the next video.